Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends. It's a great pleasure to be with you again today. And that video rather sums up, I suppose, one reflection that I have on the year which the Scottish Learning Festival always provides me with the opportunity to do is to recognise that there's a lot going on in Scottish education. And I want to go through some of that with you today and reflect on a couple of things just arising out of the performances that performance we heard this morning from St Mary's Music School and also some of the comments about Maths Week Scotland, which are obviously featured in the, the film there. One of the great privileges of my role is that I spend a vast amount of my time actually out on the road in schools looking at uh, practice and performance and trying to reflect as I take forward my judgments and decisions on education policy on what I'm actually seeing on the ground in our schools. And the first thing I want to say, and we saw a fantastic illustration of it this morning from St Mary's Music School, is that there is real true excellence in Scottish education of the highest possible quality. And that musical performance was of the highest quality performance, but I see across the country numerous examples of high quality performance in what is delivered. And I saw that really very vividly last week with Maths Week Scotland, and I'm absolutely delighted that Joe Bowler is going to be here to contribute to the Learning Festival and also to have a number of discussions I know with a number of interested parties in Scotland about just what we can learn to, from, from, from her work about how we can enhance the, the support for, the participation in and the appreciation of and the love of maths within our curriculum. And I say the love of maths because I had, frankly, one of the most bizarre experiences of my life participating in Maths Week Scotland at a seminar in Edinburgh University last Thursday night where a presentation was given by uh, Chris Smith who won the Teacher of the Year Award um, earlier this year in June. Uh, he's a maths teacher at Grange Academy in Kilmarnock and I don't know how many of you follow Chris Smith on social media and all the rest of it, but he basically brings to life um, maths study for all of his young pupils. And he went through this, frankly, farrago of nonsense in his presentation of what he does uh, each year to celebrate Pi Day. Pi Day it is the day in the year he alleged that he looks forward to the most. Apparently, most people look forward to Christmas Day and the giving of gifts and all the rest of it. He looks forward to Pi Day. And he traced back six years in his school for the experience of a six-year cohort of Grange Academy, the different ludicrous ways in which he had brought the topic of Pi to life for young people. And I want to just share one with you. He presented this picture of this clapped-out car that he had in which the myelometer was very close to 3.14, etc., etc. And he was aiming to get it to the precise number on Pi Day. And the morning of Pi Day, the plan went horribly wrong and he was one mile short. So what does he do? He then shows us this video of the turning circle for the buses outside Grange Academy with this filmed piece of him driving this clapped out car outside Grange Academy round and round and round and round and round, and round the turning circle until it got to the magic number. Now, what he then showed was the enthusiasm of the children and young people experiencing that ludicrous activity. But I bet you they remember Pi Day. They'll never forget Pi Day. And in a sense, that little illustration, I, I used not to suggest that I'm encouraging the teaching profession in Scotland to engage in dangerous driving practices <laughs> in the turning circles of our schools, simply to illustrate that as an example of how a teacher successfully brought to life uh, learning for um, uh, his pupils. And as I go around the country, I see a whole variety of different um, elements of, of that and that tremendous practice. And I just wanted to reflect on a few of them with you um, today. The first was um, a, a journey I was undertaking in the morning, going to Parliament as I do three days a week, um, listening to Radio Scotland. It's always a cheerful start to the day for me. 
Um, <laughs> those of you who heard me on the radio would realize how cheerful it was this morning. Um, but listening to the, head, the, the news being announced that St. Anthony's Primary School in Renfrewshire had won UK Literacy School of the Year, uh, a tremendous achievement by that primary school, and that's... And the head teacher came on the radio and she gave a really candid interview about how St. Anthony's Primary School had become literacy, UK Literacy School of the Year. And essentially what she said was that she and her staff, in working on the Renfrewshire programme in partnership with the University of Strathclyde, had reflected that they did not think their approach to encouraging literacy within the school was sufficiently inspiring to the children. So they went away and in short, she essentially said they had utterly changed their practice to encouraging literacy within the school. And for some folk, that would be quite a, 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 you know, quite a thing to accept on radio, national radio, that fundamental change of practice. But the results of that were so profound. And when you look at what's going on in the Renfrewshire Schools program uh, in terms of literacy, it's a really exciting illustration of how enhancing professional practice can make a profound difference to the experience of young people in our country. The second illustration uh, was a visit I paid to St. Francis Primary School in Dundee in an area of multiple deprivation. And what St. Francis Primary School decided to do um, last year and they repeated it this year, but with greater um, gusto, was to put in place a, a program over the summer to support some of their most vulnerable children in a combination uh, of play, food, and learning. And what they were able to demonstrate to me in the, with the availability of the data they had between August and December, the year before they first introduced this to the, the year they introduced it, was a profound impact on the learning of these young people as a consequence of that continued sustained engagement with the school system. It was supported by pupil equity funding uh, by St. Francis Primary School, but it was a judgment made by the school of what would make the most profound impact on those young people, and then they deployed their skills to make that happen. And the young people had benefited hugely from that imaginative approach taken by, uh, by St. Francis Primary School. Um, in the secondary school sector, I've seen a number of really precious examples of how schools who five years ago would freely admit they were wrestling with significant challenges uh, about attendance and exclusion, and I use the word carefully, exclusion, not inclusion, realizing that they had to change their whole approach to try to provide the mechanisms to encourage greater inclusion within the school and to therefore create the opportunities for young people to learn uh, within the secondary school environment. So the greater emphasis, which is very visible in a lot of secondary schools on the creation of a, a nurturing and supportive environment, I saw it very vividly at Clydebank High School where very specific support in a nurturing fashion provided to vulnerable young people had then resulted in much more sustained participation and then as a consequence much more sustained achievement by young people as a consequence of their participation. So uh, real reform in the way in which uh, education is being delivered to meet the needs of particular learners in particular situations. And the final illustration I want to share with you is again in the secondary sector, but it's about the development of the links that are important between the secondary sector and the world of work. And it struck me, well, I came face to face with it at the Dalbeekie Community Campus down in uh, the southwest of Scotland, in the Fries and Galloway. And I'm, I was down there to open this, uh, one of the new schools that have been built. It's a beautiful development, a really fabulous um, a, a three to 18 campus. Uh, with a, a wonderful nursery, a lovely primary school, and, uh, and excellent facilities for the secondary pupils. And we're going through this corridor and we go through things that are quite familiar, like science labs, and we go past some um, a, a home economics and hospitality facilities, 
and there's computer suites and there's all the things that you'd expect to see. And then they opened a door and I ended up in a garage with cars, up on jacks, with dirty people covered in mud, the oil and boiler suits and all the rest of it. And part of the design of the Albiti Community Campus at the behest of a school was to create an opportunity in rural Scotland for them to be able to deliver skills, and develop skills for young people that were closely associated with the world of work, which involved the construction of a garage as part of the school environment. I've never been in a school where I've walked through a kind of corner of the classrooms and ended up walking into a vehicle garage. And the teacher who's leading this program, a really charismatic individual, was telling me that it's been so successful that he's on the receiving end of phone calls from most garages in the southwest of Scotland offering him rubbish cars that he can take in, dismantle, rehabilitate, and then put into all that kind of stock car racing routine that goes on in different parts of Scotland. But I thought that was a tremendous example of the, the flexibility and the creativity and the innovation that the teaching profession are taking forward to ensure that young people are getting every opportunity they need to get to be able to see the breadth of opportunities within the wider uh, world of employment. Um, and we should take great heart from that innovation and that design that is underway. So the combination of that film and some of these specific examples that I've shared with you today is designed to make a point to you that I, I, I feel every time I'm in a school in Scotland that there is such a focus on ensuring we deliver quality education and quality opportunity for young people in Scotland. And I want to thank you and I want to thank the profession for the way in which you go about that on a daily basis to meet the needs of young people in Scotland. The other thing that I reflect on, um, two years into this role um, as Education Secretary in my um, third Scottish Learning Festival, I have an opportunity each year to kind of reflect on where we are, what are the things that are making an impression on me. And I suppose one of the strongest things that uh, is making an impression on me in my few and a bit years as Education Secretary is it is unlikely, unlikely we will ever have unanimity in education about what is the right thing to do or the right priority to focus on. There is always going to be debate about what are the choices. Any day of the week I get a volume of contradictory advice about what I should do and what I should take forward. If I took it all forward, then we'd be just burling around in circles all the time. So we have to make choices. But one of the things that I am most heartened about, most pleased about, is the fact that despite the fact that there are, you know, numerous education strategies, numerous education interventions, numerous ways that we could be recommended to take forward our education system. Our education system has taken to its heart the focus of government education policy, which is to deliver excellence and equity for all and to close the poverty-related attainment gap in Scottish education. And I want to thank the education system for working with us to focus on that universal priority which matters in transforming the lives of young people in Scotland. So I don't think that our education system as a whole, strategically, is focused in anything other than one clear, simple direction of the desire to close the poverty-related attainment gap and to deliver excellence and equity for all of our young people within Scottish education. That is, for me, absolutely beyond debate. Yes, of course, there'll be a range of tactical discussions and debates that we have, but fundamentally, we should be greatly heartened by that clear strategic direction that is not only just been taken forward by the Scottish Government, but it's been taken forward by our local authorities and it's been taken forward by schools the length and breadth of our country albeit in different ways, depending on different circumstances, but fundamentally, that clarity of purpose serves us well. And of course, it's not a direction of travel which is in isolation to the rest of what's going on within government. The video film that preceded me essentially made my point for me, because what it showed was that across, and it really sums up what is in my head every day of the week in my responsibilities right across 
the education and skills brief, is that we are making an intervention with interventions such as the baby box, 50,000 of them now distributed, or more than 50,000 distributed around the country, a symbol that from the country saying to every child in the country, whatever circumstances you've been born into, here is something that you are receiving and your family are receiving, whoever you are, on an equal basis with every other baby in the country, symbolizing the fact that no matter where you have come from, you are in our eyes equal, equal at birth and equal in life. A really powerful illustration of the values of the Scottish education system. So we start it with the baby box. We expand it with the, support it with the expansion of the health visitor community in Scotland. We develop it with the expansion of early learning and childcare. And I'm delighted that over the last few months we've reached agreement with our local authority partners about the financial arrangements and delivery arrangements for the expansion of early learning and childcare. It will not be straightforward, it will be a challenge, but at least we've agreed on the plan and the resources and the delivery of that agenda. It, it continues through our school system with the focus, the relentless focus on closing the poverty-related attainment gap and ensuring that every young person is able to fulfill their potential in whatever scenario and circumstance they find themselves. And it works its way into the uh, higher and further education system where we are widening access to ensure that background is not an impediment to whether or not young people are able to access higher or further education. And it's entrenched by the work that we take forward, illustrated by Dalbiti Community Campus, about making sure that the connections between our school system and the world of work are as strong as they possibly can be to make sure that young people can move to positive destinations as a consequence of their participation in education. And then as a consequence of the programme for government that was announced by the First Minister just a few weeks ago, we are seeing all of that agenda being strengthened with the investment in further resources to support the delivery of effective mental health services and support, particularly in our schools, but also in further and higher education circumstances, meeting or recognising the needs of young people and responding positively to the feedback they have given us through the channels of discussion that we have taken forward with them. So all of that is designed to say that what the government is focusing on across all of these different interventions is how we can essentially interrupt a pattern of the life experience of individuals within Scotland that has resulted in some individuals in our country not being able to fulfill their potential. All of these different interventions, compatible and complementary, are designed to make sure we interrupt that over a 25-year cohort to ensure that we deliver the very best for young people within Scotland and transform their possibilities. So I don't, although the demands on the school system to contribute to that agenda are significant, and I'm very grateful to the school system for the way in which it is focused on the work to close the poverty-related attainment gap, I want to assure you that this is part of a wider agenda to transform the lives of young people within Scotland and to recognise uh, the importance of doing that on a sustained basis across a range of policy areas to make that necessary impact. Now, as we look at the, uh, the, 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 the work to close the poverty-related attainment gap, I think it's important that we look at what progress we're actually making. And there's a lot of data is um, published around these questions. There'll be more data published on that in December of this year when we update the National Improvement Framework. But if we look back over the last five years, what we see is steady progress in closing the poverty-related attainment gap. At level four, five years ago, the gap between the attainment of the, uh, the, 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 the most deprived to the least deprived was 8.2 percentage points. Last year, it was 5.9. At level five, the gap had fallen from 28.1% to 19.3. And at level six, it's gone down from 44.3 to 37.6%. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that the job is done. We said it would take us 
when we set out on this journey in 2015, we said it would take us at least 10 years to close the poverty-related attainment gap. But we should take heart that the data is demonstrating to us that we are making progress in that journey, and that progress has been made because of the excellent work that's gone on within Scottish schools, and we should be proud of what is being achieved there. And a lot of that has been given very sharpened focus by the delivery of the Scottish Attainment Challenge. And we've seen the progress of the Scottish Attainment Challenge since 2015, where in a number of local authorities and individual schools, the very focused in, in injection of additional resources have been successful in supporting the improvement in practice within schools and in assisting the progress of young people. And that's been reinforced more widely with the introduction in 2017-18 uh, of pupil equity funding, which is now extending to 96% of schools around the country. And what pupil equity funding has succeeded in doing has been to unleash a creativity and an innovation and a spirit of innovation within our schools, which is absolutely breathtaking. Because schools have been able to utilize, in some cases, some small amounts of resource, in other cases, some very significant amounts of resource to make a profound difference in the educational proposition that's made available to young people within our schools. And as I look around the country, as I look at the different ways in which schools have taken forward pupil equity funding, I'm hugely impressed by the creativity that's been undertaken to ensure that we are able to meet the different and distinctive needs of young people in different parts of the country with different backgrounds and different circumstances. And there shouldn't be a uniform pupil equity funding approach across the country. That is the antithesis of the purpose of pupil equity funding. What it's about is about empowering individual schools to make the decisions that are right for the young people that are presenting themselves in those schools and to establish in many cases much better and greater connections with families and with home life to make sure that progress is made as a consequence. So on all of that agenda, I think we can take considerable encouragement from the progress that has been made. And indeed, when we invited the International Council of Education Advisors who are here with us today, and I'm delighted that they're here again to contribute to Scottish education. In their report after two years of their work, they essentially said, and I paraphrased lots of deep and wide thinking that the Council gave to us, that by and large we were on the right track and doing broadly the right things. Yes, there'll be individual things that we need to strengthen and improve and reform and revise, and of course I'm listening to that and I have listened to that, but broadly the direction of travel within Scottish education is in the correct direction. So where do we go from here? Well, for me, um, any successful education system, of all the things we might debate and all the rest of it, fundamentally, a strong education system relies upon the quality of learning and teaching and on the strength of leadership within the education system. And that's leadership right across the, the, the system, in classrooms, in schools, in local authorities, in government, across all aspects of our education system. So the importance of investing in learning and teaching and the importance of investing in leadership are central to the agenda that uh, I'm setting out to you today. And there's three areas that I think we need to concentrate on and which I'd encourage you to reflect on as you develop your practice in supporting our strategic objective of closing the poverty-related attainment gap and delivering excellence and equity for all. And the first of those is collaboration. When we invited the OECD to review Scottish education in 2015, they basically said to us we didn't have enough collaboration in our system. So that's why we've encouraged the creation of regional improvement collaboratives. Um, I'm delighted that we now have all six of them up and running. There's uh, demonstration stalls um, through in the, in the exhibition area of uh, each of the improvement collaboratives. And what I'm keen to make sure they become are focal points, forums, for the sharing and the development of world-class practice in Scottish education. They're not to be more bureaucratic governance structures, 
with extra layers of reporting and all the rest of it. They are to be an invitation, essentially, to the teaching profession to think, as I illustrated with my uh, example of Chris Smith and Grange Academy, of stuff that's going on in an individual classroom in a school in Ayrshire that might be beneficial for others around the country to see more of and to hear of. And that, of course, is at the heart of the purpose of the Scottish Learning Festival, to create that platform. But the regional improvement collaboratives are there to share and to develop the world-class practice we need to make sure Scottish education is successful. And I invite all of you, if whatever role you have in Scottish education, whether you're a head teacher looking out over your staff thinking, I can think of somebody who's doing absolutely world-class work in their classroom, and I want to make sure they're encouraged to get to that regional improvement collaborative and share it with others, or whether you're a classroom teacher thinking, what I'm doing is world-class, and I want more people to hear about it and to get on with doing that. That's the invitation to ensure that that is shared more widely across our education system. So the first thing is that encouragement of greater collaboration, and I have to say, the invitation and the encouragement to collaborate is, I think, more effective now within our system, and there is much more of it happening, but much more of it needs to happen in the period going forward. The second major element is about empowerment. And uh, you'll have heard the great controversy about my decision not to proceed with legislation on an education bill. And the reason for that is quite simple. I was able to reach a common agreement with our local authority partners on how best to take forward the empowerment agenda that will ensure that our schools and our head teachers are in the driving seat of more and more of the decisions that affect young people based on the simple premise supported by international evidence that the best place to take decisions about the education of young people is the closest to where those young people are presenting themselves in the system. And that's what we're seeing with pupil equity funding, where decisions are being taken based on the needs and the circumstances of individual children and making that profound impact on their lives. So I'm delighted that we've reached a voluntary agreement with local authorities about empowerment so that we work together as a system to create an empowered culture within our education system, because that is what we need. We need individual classroom teachers, we need school community, we need head teachers to think about the ways in which they can take forward the agenda of education in individual schools to meet the needs of young people to the best of their ability. I have a, I, I, I was given a set of postcards um, a couple of years ago by Sir Bill Gamel a former Scotland Rugby International who goes around, many of you will be familiar with a lot of the work that Bill and his organisation do about a growth mindset. And he gave me this set of motivational postcards. And one of them sits at the top of the pile on my desk in Parliament. And it says this, proceed until apprehended. That's what I'd like you to do. Proceed until apprehended. Because you're the educators who know what you're doing and engage with your school communities in a spirit of proceeding until apprehended. And I think we'll have a stronger education system if we do likewise. So empowerment is the second of my uh, further themes. And my last one is improvement. We have to have a constant focus on improvement in our education system. If I go back to my story about the head teacher from St. Anthony's Primary School, what she talked about on the radio was a desire to improve, a determination to improve the appreciation of literacy within the school and the necessity to improve practice to make sure that could come about. And we have to have that constant search for improvement. That's what links it together with the collaboratives because there are ways in which we can share that best practice and enhanced learning and teaching. But we've also got to be focused on the measures of progress that are made to try to ensure that we are achieving our objectives. I talked about some of the data earlier on, and I'm going to talk for a moment about some of the other data because data issues are, let me say, somewhat hot in Scottish education just now, if I can put it euphemistically. 
today, I, one, of my, one of my regrets about today is that I'm not going to be able to spend the whole day at the Learning Festival, which I would normally do um, to take in all of what's going on and to have a chance informally to speak to many uh, members of the profession who are here, because I'm going back to Parliament to take part in a debate about primary one standardised assessments. And I just want to run through why we've, why we've got to where we are today. If we go back to 2015 and the OECD report on Scottish education, what the OECD, the OECD said a number of things to us. One was that we didn't collaborate enough. And the second was that we didn't have in place uh, sufficient uh, data and information to chart the progress of young people through our education system. And it was in response to that recommendation and that call that the government took the decision to introduce standardised assessments to help inform teacher judgment about the progress that young people were making in the different levels of curriculum for excellence. And why is that important? Well, for me, it's important. I'm a parent. I've got a seven-year-old son. I want my son to progress well through the education system. I want his teachers to be confident in what he's doing. And as a parent, I want to know what my wife and I can do to help him and support him on his journey. And I can't imagine there are any parents in the country who don't have the same motivation about their children, or they certainly shouldn't have any different motivation. So where we arrived at with standardised assessment was to ensure that the professional judgment of teachers upon which our judgment about closing the poverty-related attainment gap in Scottish education depends, because that's what we report on on an annual basis. That's what Parliament's going to hold me accountable for as to whether or not we have closed the attainment gap or not. That, we wanted that judgment to be informed by information arising out of standardised assessments. And one of the points that struck me quite vividly as I talked to teachers uh, throughout my time as Education Secretary, and certainly back in my early days, was there was a lot of uncertainty within the profession about what particular levels looked like and felt like within CFE. Now, I think the introduction of benchmarks have helped to provide more and more of that clarity to the teaching profession. But standardised assessments help to do exactly that as well, to help to inform and moderate practice around the country, not to skew practice, not to drive it in a particular direction, but to provide a reference point for teachers to be able to say, well, I think what is going on in my class is broadly in line with where expectations of the education system should be. And the reason why all of that matters is that I want, and I think you all want, to be certain that wherever a young person comes through the doors of a school in our country, in whatever locality it happens to be, that they're coming into a school that will ensure that their educational needs are being met as well as we possibly can do and to make sure that young person is equipped for the world that lies ahead. And that is why we've taken forward the decisions that we've taken forward. And obviously, I'm going through to Parliament, and we'll have a debate about it this afternoon, and we'll see if we get to it at the end of that debate, and I'll reflect on that at the end of the debate. But that's the reason why. And why is it important that we equip young people with uh, all of what is required to meet the challenges of the time? Well, I was reminded of this by, in a talk that I heard from Sir Ken Robinson, just the other day there at an education conference, where Ken Robinson took an iPhone out of his pocket. Uh, if I hadn't believed in, C in Curriculum for Excellence before I heard this talk, I would have believed in it afterwards. I believed in it beforehand, by the way, but this made the point to me. He took an iPhone out of his pocket and said, look at this. In 10 years, this thing has utterly changed the world as we know it and how we operate, how we live. I spend far too much of my life gazing at the wretched thing, and I'm sure you do as well. His point was, in 10 years, the world has been turned upside down by one device. So we need to equip our young people with the skills, the attributes, the capabilities to make sure they can deal with all of that in a constantly changing and evolving world. Which brings me back to a fundamental about Scottish education, about which I think we should be very proud and very confident. This country engaged in a debate when 
there wasn't necessarily an absolutely pressing imperative for it to happen, but it engaged in it, about what did we want to achieve in our education system. And we came to the conclusion that what we wanted to achieve was a system that equipped young people with the skills and the capacities and the capabilities to deal with an ever-changing world, and we settled on curriculum for excellence. And there, my little example from Sir Ken Robinson is a, is a very simple and clear example of why the decision to advance and deliver curriculum for excellence was the right decision for us to take here in Scotland. We have to be confident about it, we have to be bold about it, and we've got to make sure that young people leave our system equipped for the 21st century as a consequence of the steps that we take forward. And today, in 2018, I think we're a great deal stronger in being able to do that as a consequence of the unified focus that we've got in the system on delivering excellence and equity for every single one of the young people in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Swinney. And uh, as usual, you've set aside some time for us to have a question and answer session. Um, I'm going to start by asking uh, our delegates in the auditorium for some questions, maybe two or three at a time. Is that, yeah, would, that yeah, would that work? Well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those watching in the rooms elsewhere in the centre, <coughs> then please, uh, if you have a question, write it down. Please write your name and where you're from with your question, and it will be winged its way to us here uh, on, on the stage. And uh, similarly, for people here in the auditorium, if you would like to ask a question, if you could raise your hand, we have some mics coming round, and you could let us know uh, who you are and where you're from. So this is your opportunity now to ask some questions. Anything that's uh, happening in education at the moment? <laughs> that you're keen to get a view on, please raise your hand and we have some mics which will be moved towards you. Oh, we've got a question over this yes, side, sir. okay. We'll maybe take a group of two or three questions. Uh, good morning, um, Mr. Swinney. I'm Natasha York from St. Peter's Primary School in Gala Shields down in the Scottish Borders. Um, I was interested by your comments about the standardised assessments in P1. I can appreciate um, your argument about where the basis for that comes from and that you need rigorous evidence um, and that the OECD advised that that, that, sh that was advisable. However, speaking as a primary school teacher, um, my experience of the P1 standardised assessments is that they are not fit for purpose and that they are actually a huge waste of time and money in the way that they're being um, enforced in uh, primary schools. And it's not that I have a, an objection in principle to the idea of standard assessment, but what I'm seeing in practice is that they don't work, they're not suitable, and my colleagues around me um, that I've talked to, I'm sure feel exactly the same. And this is, as far as I understand, a widespread feeling in Scottish primary schools. They're simply not fit for purpose. Okay, so, thank you for that point. Um, I, I do have quite a few questions to get in, and I think you've made your point very clearly. And I'll uh, see if we can take another couple. I think we've got um, one over here. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> my name's Derek Todd from Deaf Scotland. It's really good to hear you mention collaboration and empowerment and improvement. And it's, it's excellent to see the development that's happening. I have two concerns that affect deaf children and young people. One is the number of teachers of the deaf. There seems to be a declining number of teachers of the deaf, but an increase in number of deaf children which means many young deaf children are suffering in not getting the equality of education that they should. Second thing is mental health, access to communication. There are many barriers for young deaf children 
And we need to make sure that there is greater access for deaf children who use English and British Sign Language and that these things are identified. Thank you. And I think there was a point just behind you as well. So we'll quickly take a third one. And uh, thank you. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Kat Calvert. I'm the head teacher in North Lanarkshire. I would, kind of, I would actually disagree about the point with the SNSAs. We um, have quite a small primary one. However, we didn't find any level of stress in them at all for our primary ones. They quite enjoyed taking part. They enjoyed coming out. Um, in terms of the feedback that they gave, we found them to be extremely helpful. We had a small group of boys who I think actually we had the wrong measure of um, when it comes down to teacher judgment. And it changed how we looked at the support that they needed going into primary two. And we felt that it gave us a lot more information on them. It, um, I think we had underestimated them and the quality of feedback and the depth of feedback that the SNSA gave us really helped those children. And I would say that that was probably about 40% of children that that had a positive impact on, you know, in terms of how their primary two would go. Um, so I, I, I think, I just would like to say that I don't think that that is reflective of all um, teachers okay. across Scotland. Th thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, let me deal, first of all, with, with Derek's uh, two points. Um, obviously, fundamentally, um, we have to make sure that we are meeting the needs of every young person within Scotland, uh, whatever their particular needs are. Um, so we have to make sure we have in place the, um, the teaching resource that can support young people and to assist them in that respect. Now, we provide uh, some financial support as a government to encourage the, um, the training of uh, teachers of the deaf. Uh, we have to make sure that we have um, adequate supplies of those individuals in, in place, as, of course, we have to uh, assess that across the country. But fundamentally, if we're going to fulfil our commitment to get it right for every child, we have to make sure that we are putting all of that um, in place to, uh, to, to, to support young people. And that has to be uh, you know, a child-by-child -child assessment as to whether or not those needs are being met. On the, the mental health point, I, I made reference in my comments to the increase in resources that have been made available to uh, support mental health activity within uh, schools, we are obviously dealing with a very significant upsurge in the presentation of mental health challenges by young people. Um, if we try to, the, the, the level of waiting times for um, CAM services is far too long, so we have to intervene earlier to try to better support young people. Um, in that respect, which is what the changes that were announced in the programme for government were designed to do. And obviously we're working with the school system on how we take that forward effectively in the period going forward. Now, on the, 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 the two points on um, standardised assessments um, in P1, in a sense, that kind of, the contrast of remarks rather illustrates the, the, the challenge, um, illustrates my point about the fact that we're not you know, we're, we're not all in one point of agreement about these things. I think what's important is that, well, fundamentally, I'm listening to what people are saying. So there's been, we've gone through year one of the standardised assessments. Um, do I think we'll get everything right in year one? No, that's why we've made certain reforms to the standardised assessments for the application into year two. And I'll continue to listen. I've set up um, opportunities for more practitioner feedback so that we can understand the, um, the, the feedback from within the profession. I think what struck me, when I first looked at the, um, the standardised assessments, I looked at them with a group of teachers. And we went through the assessments and generally they thought they were, they were, they, 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 they were working fine uh, and they were appropriate. What literally drew an intake of breath from the teachers that I was with was when they saw the diagnostic information and the way it was presented. Because it essentially marshalled, and I think it was the point that was being made um, by a lady over here, it marshalled some of the strengths and the challenges that young people face. And the purpose of standardised assessments is to make sure that we're able to learn from what the experience of young people has been 
what their challenges are and then to do something about it. Because we all know that the attainment gap exists when young people come into formal education. Our challenge is to try to narrow that as quickly as we possibly can do, which is why I happen to take the view that P1 assessments are helpful in that respect. But I do give you the assurance that I will continue to listen very carefully to the feedback that comes from practitioners about the operation of the assessments, because fundamentally I want them to be a tool that is advantageous for the learner journey of children within Scotland. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to take some more questions from in the auditorium. I think some are coming from the rooms as well. So if you put your hand up here, if you would like to ask a question, and yeah, we've got one here. We can pass the mic along and then wave at the back as well. Um, hi, Mr. Swinney. Um, I would just like to say, first of all, from my uh, experience on the Scottish Education Council, that it's been a fantastic opportunity to, um, I suppose, have an insight into how education policy is made and also to discuss my um, school experiences with the top boss, um, I guess you could say. But um, from being on the council, um, I'm sure, as you will remember, that I, re I raised concerns about revisions being made to the National Five qualifications, whereby you removed the unit assessments um, in a bid to um, I suppose relief workload and stress and I understand that you say from the decrease in um, passes from last year that's natural but are we actually tackling the exam stress overall because it's still very much evident. Thank okay you. thanks for that question. Um, any other questions that we can see up the back? There's, oh. one, there's one over there I saw. Brilliant okay over this side. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm Smart, Montrose Academy. Uh, schools and local authorities are really grateful for all of the money that's being invested in schools, but a huge issue for us is recruiting staff and retaining staff. And I just wonder, what are the, uh, what are the plans of the Scottish Government to try and increase staffing? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one halfway up the, at the back there. Well, we could take that one, for, and I'll come to you um, afterwards. Yeah, okay. Um, Larry Flanagan, EIS. Uh, John, could I ask you a question uh, uh, around empowerment? empowerment? Uh, and I'm not going to revisit the discussion around SNSAs per se, but one of the issues that we have raised with you was a set of guidelines were produced, one of which was that teachers would control when these assessments were done, primarily in the interest of the pupil. And we know that 25 out of 32 local authorities reached that guideline and instructed teachers when to carry out assessments. So in terms of empowerment, there's the rub. How do we turn the, the rhetoric around professional autonomy, professional voice into a reality when on such an, an issue as the SNSAs, there's a very basic example of teachers not being empowered. We share the empowerment agenda, but uh, I think the experience of a lot of teachers is we are still a top-down system in terms of hierarchical instruction. So how do we get past that and actually empower teachers to have professional autonomy, professional voice in the classroom? Okay, okay. thank you for that. Um, on the first point uh, about exam stress, um, first of all, I want, I want to just tell a little story about the Scottish Education Council where pupils come along to uh, participate in, the and we've had excellent participation in the Scottish Education Council. We had a meeting in Perth Academy, and um, on the, sitting around the table of uh, the Education Council was the Chief Executive of Perth and Kinross Council, and the Director of Education of Perth and Kinross Council, who's our collaborative lead in Tayside. And three pupils from Perth Academy turned up and, um, to make a presentation about their school. And believe you me, they seized their opportunity. Because with the Chief Executive of the Council President and the Director of Education, they made an absolutely vigorous presentation of how absolutely awful the toilet provision in Perth Academy was, and it had to be addressed as a matter of urgency. And you're not going to believe it, it was addressed as a matter of urgency by the Council. So pupil voice is central to what we have to do. Now, on the issue of exam stress, obviously, like it, it, it was one of the material decisions 
factors in my decision about uh, unit assessments because I had obviously teacher representation about it, about workload. But what was also clear to me uh, in the first exam diet that I presided over was an awful lot of parental worry about young people's stress because of the volume of assessment that was being undertaken um, in a very congested period around unit assessments. So I think we've got to, we have to be constantly mindful about that and we have to try to ensure that within the uh, arrangements that we put in place within our schools that we're providing the support and the context for young people in the handling of exam and assessment arrangements, that we do that in a, in a supportive and a sympathetic way and in a fashion that actually recognises there are challenges that have to be overcome in the, in, in, in the outlook of, of young people. And it's certainly what we've announced as a government to try to help put in place some of the early intervention resources within schools are designed to help in exactly that, uh, with that issue. Now, on Malcolm's point from Montrose Academy, um, we've, we saw last year uh, an increase in the number of teachers within the profession were up 543 um, uh, uh, over the last year. Um, we've expanded the um, intake into initial teacher education and we've also designed about another 11, 12 routes into initial teacher education, some of which are very innovative, involving, for example, the University of the Highlands and Islands in distance learning so that we can try to reach into communities where it's physically impossible and impractical for people who have commitments in rural Scotland to leave those areas to go to some of our initial teacher education um, schools um, to actually get their, 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 to do their, their, their initial teacher education in their own locality, uh, which may also help with the recruitment of, of teachers into the profession. So there's a, a whole range of different approaches being taken to, to do that. So, th so there are a range of measures that we're trying to do to, to expand the teaching population. I recognise, however, there are other developments we need to take forward. Um, I've, I think we've, we don't have sufficiently good career pathways for teachers in the education system. I think we largely only have one route for progression available, and, is the, and that is into senior leadership within schools, and that doesn't always suit everybody. And we need to recognise, and this is one of my major priorities, about strengthening practice and pedagogy within our schools and specialism within our schools, that we need to create career pathways that are rewarding for subject specialists and for profession specialists. So Moira Bolland from, uh, is convening a group for me which will essentially work with the professional associations and with um, members of the profession to design new career pathways which will create routes whereby individuals don't need to go into senior leadership but can develop their career within the classroom and become some of these leading experts in curricular, curriculum delivery and design and in specialist teaching approaches around the country. And when I look at what some schools have done with PEF, for example, some schools have invested in, in literacy or in math specialists to try to supplement their activity throughout the school and that's a recognition of the creation of more specialist routes and directions within schooling. Um, I, I suppose I, I can't probably proceed much further with this answer without mentioning the issue of pay, um, which I know is a very live subject. I thought Larry Flanagan was actually going to answer the question before I even got anywhere near it in, the, uh, in, in his contribution, but um, obviously we're in a pay negotiation which is material to whether the profession is an attractive profession. I don't think people come into teaching for the money, but I can understand how people have got to feel effectively well remunerated in their professional activity, and that's, we're obviously in a, a live active pay negotiation at this time with our local authority partners. So those are some of the things that we're trying to take forward. I think also what would probably help, Malcolm, is if we had um, a bit more of a positive uh, commentary about Scottish education. And my reason for saying that is that I spend more time in schools than any other person commenting on the education system in Scotland. And I'm prepared to be challenged on that point. I spend much more time in schools than anyone else that offers an opinion about Scottish education. And I don't think 
the education system that I hear being talked about in Parliament or discussed in the media is the education system that I see when I go in and out of schools in our country, because our schools are excellent and we should be proud of them around the country. <laughs> now, lastly, Larry Flanagan's point is a very serious point, and it's one uh, that I, I don't always say this, I agree with Larry Flanagan about. It's maybe, a bit, it's maybe about all that I agree with Larry Flanagan about, but it's nice to have at least one thing. Uh, it's not quite as bad as that, but um, the, I do th the guidance is very clear from the government that teachers should choose at what point in the year it is advisable and appropriate to undertake the standardised assessments. And I think that should be respected around the country. And I'll, from the feedback that I've had from the EIS survey, that's one of the material issues that I will pursue in my discussions with local authorities because if we agree these things, we should follow them up practically on the ground. But there is a deeper point that comes from this, which is about culture. Because it is important that we have a culture of empowerment. We can't just say empowered and say that's the end of it. We have to have a culture of empowerment. It has to be reflected in the decision making, the signals that individual schools are getting from local authorities about different points of, uh, of, of process and procedure. So that's an issue that I will take up um, and it's a, an issue I'm completely in agreement about that it should be up to teachers to decide when these assessments are undertaken within the school year. Okay, thank you for that. And um, we do have a few questions that have come from uh, elsewhere in the building. Uh, one does mention pay. So uh, you were correct in, in highlighting that as, as an issue that could be touched upon. Peter Woods from Dumfries and Galloway College says that given that teachers and lecturers are currently in dispute over pay, is it not time that the value of education is reflected in the value of teaching professionals? How confident are you that progress can be made on pay? So and I appreciate you might be limited in, in, in what you're allowed to say about that at the moment. Um, Gwen Gilmer, who's a head teacher from Argyle and Butte at a special school, uh, says that great work's being done in PEF to close the attainment gap, but what's being done to look at equity for pupils with additional support needs, especially those with complex needs that are not always poverty related? So thank you to Gwen. And then uh, finally, we have uh, an international delegate from the Netherlands who would like to make the point uh, or would like to ask, uh, what can you do to ensure that the outcome of assessments aren't going to lead uh, to a similar situation that they have in the Netherlands where it's effectively a very powerful instrument for league tables and uh, making schools seen as excellent or weak? Um, what, what can be done to ensure that that doesn't happen, given what you said in your talk? Thank you. Um, on, on, Peter's, on Peter's point, first of all, about pay, obviously we've got, you know, we're actively involved in pay negotiations, so there's, there was discussions yesterday, uh, there's more discussions planned on these things between the pay as a product of the government, um, local authorities and the professional associations equally in the... Um, in the further education sector, which uh, Peter is in, um, they're between the colleges association and, um, a, and a, the, the professional associations. Uh, so those talks are underway. Am I confident? Yeah, because I'm very interested in getting to a deal and an agreement. Um, we obviously just have to let these discussions take their course and uh, get to a conclusion as swiftly as we possibly can do. Um, on Gwen's point about um, the support for pupils with additional support needs. Um, in a sense, my answer is quite similar to what I said to Derek a moment ago over here, which is that our, our system is founded on the concept of getting it right for every child. So we have to ensure that the appropriate assessment of needs is made about every individual child. Now, for the overwhelming majority of, of young children and young people, their needs will be met within mainstream education. For a large number of uh, young people with special needs, they will also, with support, be able to have their needs met within mainstream education, but we have to be satisfied about that point. We have to be satisfied that the right judgments have been made about the educational setting for young people, and if they are in mainstream education, to make sure that that is, um, 
they have all the support that is required. And that has to be, as I said to Derek a moment ago, a child-by-child -child, um, assessment. Um, and then finally, to the delegate from the Netherlands, uh, we've obviously been very clear that we um, have no interest in league tables. Um, we will not compose them. It's not the purpose of the standardised assessment. The sta purpose of standardised assessment is to help with the, the moderation of practice uh, and levels around the country and to ensure that we identify the specific developmental needs of individual young people which may not naturally crystallise in the education process. So the way in which we handle the information and the way we process it is designed to avoid, as far as we possibly can do, the creation of league tables. And I don't think league tables serve anybody whatsoever because in large parts of our country, young people, and this is where, I, this is where I, my fundamental view about education is founded. If I think about the young people who are in, I, I represent a large rural constituency and part of a city uh, as well. Young people in my community don't really have a choice about where they can go to for their schooling because geography dictates it. It would be impractical in vast parts of Scotland for anyone to have any choice about where they go for their education. So what is the point of league tables in vast parts of Scotland? The important point is making sure that wherever a child walks in the door of a school, they're going into an excellent school. So we're supporting practice and we're supporting the development of learning and teaching. And so that's what, because you know, the existence of a league table is irrelevant to vast parts of the country. What is relevant is what we can do to support the improvement of performance and practice in individual schools to make sure that young people get a world-class education. And that's what I'm focused on. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Swinney. And I'm conscious of time because there are... Uh...